Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today to today's program. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. Please stay tuned to the end of today's program for a brief update on our upcoming programs. Also, becoming a member is a great way to support our organization and to help us continue to be able to provide you with this quality programming. So please go to our website at lawacph.org and join today. For those of you who would like to ask our speaker and moderator questions, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program that will start in about 30 to 35 minutes. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, U.S.-Australia Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, a dialogue with Professor Gordon Flake. He is the CEO and founder of the Perth U.S. Asia Center at the University of Western Australia. Today's program will be moderated by Dr. John Park, who is director of the Korean Project at Harvard Kennedy School of Belfer Center. We'd like to thank our event partner, the Australian Consulate in Los Angeles, as well as Consul General Jane Duke, who has a brief mes message for you now before we begin today's conversation. Thank you. Good morning, and thanks very much, Kim. We greatly appreciate the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall hosting today's webinar with Professor Gordon Flake. Gordon is one of the world's foremost experts on the Indo-Pacific, and I've had the great pleasure of working with him over the past few years, including in my previous roles. I'm delighted he is in Los Angeles to speak with you today about Australia-US cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. It's been a momentous few weeks for Australia-US relations, to recap, on September 15, President Biden, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced a new enhanced partnership with a new acronym, the AUKUS. And on September 16, Australia's Foreign and Defence Ministers met US Secretaries of State and Defence at the annual OSMI meeting in Washington DC, which had its own set of very important outcomes. And on September 24, Prime Minister Morrison met President Biden, Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Suga for the first in-person Quad Leaders Summit in Washington DC. The historic summit, six months after the leaders' first virtual meeting in March, sent a powerful signal of the Quad's commitment to addressing the most defining challenges of our time. This year also marks the 70th anniversary of the formal Australia-US Alliance Treaty, the ANZUS. The Alliance was formed in the wake of World War II and its mission 70 years on is just as important as it ever was. Today, the Indo-Pacific is the epicentre of both global opportunity and strategic competition and it is the focus of the Alliance. Australia and the United States have a shared vision for the Indo-Pacific that is open, inclusive, resilient and prosperous. We share a commitment to ASEAN and to ASEAN centrality. Together, we are contributing actively and purposefully to shaping the region during this period of challenge. Our existing cooperation is deepened by these new partnerships and ambitious outcomes of the past few weeks. It is guided by our commitment to the international rules-based order to ensure that nations of the region have the strategic space to make decisions in their sovereign interests. I look forward to Professor Flake and Dr Park sharing their perspectives on these important developments and the context in which these are taking place. Again, my special thanks to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall for hosting this webinar. And with that, I'll pass back to you, Kim. Thank you, Consul General Duke. And without further ado, Dr. Park and Professor Flake, I'd like to invite you on for this important discussion on US-Australian relations in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you very much, Kim, and thank you to Consul General Duke for her warm remarks there. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, moderate this event with Professor Gordon Plate because it's a reunion of sorts. Uh, when I worked at a think tank in Washington, uh, Gordon was kind of like the senior in high school. We we're the freshmen. He was a phenomenal mentor. And in addition to being a leading expert, uh, he's really a community builder. And so from that time, Gordon, a, a warm thank you and, and great to see you again. I wanted to take us down a number of different paths and really maximize the time for the discussion here. 
And Gordon, I'd like to start off with setting the context here. Uh, and I think from your unique experience of being in Australia during these amazing changes going on in the Asia Pacific and now the Indo-Pacific region, uh, I wanted to first start off with how did your views about Australia in particular and Australia's role in back then uh, the Asia Pacific region, uh, how did those views change after you uh, moved to Perth? Well, thank you, John. It is, it is wonderful to see you again, albeit only virtually. Uh, and let me also extend my thanks to the World Affairs Council of LA's uh, President Hugh McCleary uh, and Australia's wonderful uh, Consul General here in Los Angeles, Jane Duke. Uh, ambassador Duke served as the US, uh, Australian ambassador to ASEAN for years. And so from our perch in Western Australia, uh, which where Perth is closer to Jakarta than it is to Canberra and closer to Singapore than Sydney, we worked very closely with her and appreciate her tremendous contributions to the Indo-Pacific. Um, your question is a really good place to start. Uh, as you know, I spent 25 years in Washington, D.C. in the think tank community there before defecting to the farthest city on the planet on land away from Washington, Perth, uh, about eight years ago now. Uh, and it is true that, that where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, and so my views in Washington, D.C., on some issues are very different than my views that I hold now in, in Western Australia. Um, to begin with, um, um, I uh, was hesitant about this concept of the Indo-Pacific. I thought it was kind of a silly academic notion that if you took the entirety of the Indian Ocean and you combine it with the entirety of the Pacific Ocean, then you end up having more than two thirds of the world. You might as well be global. It didn't have any real utility in explaining foreign policy or, or aiding foreign policy. Um, but sitting as I do now at the fulcrum of the Indo-Pacific in Western Australia, where we kind of straddle the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, as Australia does as a two, if not three, ocean nation, my views are quite different. Um, um, I, I took the job, and you will understand this well, given your long focus on Northeast Asia, looking at American alliances uh, in Northeast Asia, primarily through the prism of Korea versus Japan, two treaty allies of the United States right next to each other that you know had slightly different status and forces agreements, slightly different basing agreements. Um, and I understood that Australia was different. I knew there was something called the five eyes, the, you know, with the Australia, Canada, the UK, New Zealand, United States. But I kind of thought that difference was primarily language, culture, shared history. And while it is true, what some like to call the Anglosphere does have shared language, culture, and history, it's actually much deeper than that. It's actually the intelligent sharing, the legal underpinning, underpinning of alliance relationships uh, that has been there since the end of World War II that has led you know, the Australia-US alliance to be by orders of magnitude, more closely integrated and more intimate than that I was familiar with. And so that really shifted my view of alliances, uh, what was possible. And again, as Ambassador Duke mentioned, uh, we've seen this week how much more is possible given that underpinning. But it also shifted my views on the Indo-Pacific because I, I half jokingly tell some people that I am the physical manifestation of the US rebalance towards Asia. Uh, it is wonderful to wake up every morning in Perth knowing I'm in the same time zone as Singapore, Hong Kong, Manila, Beijing, uh, and with an hour off of Seoul and Tokyo or Delhi on the other side. It just gives one a very different perspective of the world and the Indo-Pacific. That's terrific. So with that, you know, in, in addition to setting the context here, Gordon, when we look at your perspectives on China, and we zero in on those. Uh, how did your perspectives change, and specifically from this perch and birth? Well, it's interesting. Um, again, I took the job knowing that my understanding of Southeast Asia, where Australia has a tremendous comparative advantage just by proximity alone. Uh, so the, the depth of knowledge and understanding of Southeast Asia in Australia continues to exceed that largely in the United States. Um, and the United States tends to, to rely upon Australia as an ally because of that depth of expertise. China is a different story. I don't know that my views of China have, have evolved as much as I think Australian views of China have changed during the eight years of my tenure there. Um, to be clear, I have had 38 trips to China. I've been to 40 cities. 
I have hundreds of friends in China. I would never, ever put myself in a China ambassador camp. I believe that despite the current trajectory of China, over the course of most of my professional career, China continued to reform and open up and move in a very positive way. And yet, when I arrived in Perth, I brought with me a very Washington DC perspective, which is that I was more concerned about Chinese weakness than Chinese strength. Now you can imagine how the, the, even the hint of Chinese weakness went over in Perth, Western Australia. The, uh, Australia, Western Australia accounts for about 70% of Australia's exports. The vast majority of that are natural resources, iron ore, LNG, and the vast majority of those go to a single market in China. So the notion that there was any possibility of anything other than another unbroken 30-year trajectory of growth in China wasn't well received in Western Australia. But over the last eight years, um, the decisions made in China in terms of the Xi Jinping government uh, and, and their broader approach to foreign policy, their broader approach to diplomacy, uh, the use of economic coercion, things I'm sure we'll talk about you know, against countries like Australia, uh, their activities in the South China Seas, et cetera, have led to kind of a, a re-evaluation in Australia more broadly about China's role in the world. So in the end, I don't know that my views have shifted as much as Australians' views have kind of recalibrated to the new reality that we face today. That's really helpful. And, and on the theme of calibration, uh, I wanted to uh, shift the conversation a bit and broaden it out. And you know, clearly, I think there's a need for precision in assessing how the U.S. views China and vice versa. Uh, with that, the first question to you is, you know, in your perspective, what are the areas where the U.S. overestimates or underestimates China? Again, um, I'll, I'll go back to that same kind of phrase that I used eight years ago and I continue to use today, is that I'm far more worried about Chinese weakness than I am Chinese strength. Uh, and, and by that, look, for the last 40 years, you would be foolish to bet against China. Uh, beginning with Deng Xiaoping in particular, they pursued a series of opening and reform measures uh, that largely became known as the Deng Xiaoping consensus. That, that, that's what China was built upon increasing personal freedoms, increasing ability to move, uh, increasing flexibility in terms of labor, uh, openness to foreign direct investment, openness to foreign po policies and procedures, uh, desiring to be more integrated into the world system, and then private sector, private sector, private sector. That led to 30 years of Chinese growth. Uh, unfortunately, I think we're in an era right now where many of those have been or if they haven't already been or in the process of being reversed, going the opposite direction. Uh, and so when I say I'm more worried about Chinese weakness, number one, I'm talking about demography. Um, you know, the, the largest segment in China's labor force today is ages 50 to 70. Uh, Chinese demographers, not Western demographers, but Chinese demographers for 30 years have been you know, alarmed about the consequences of the one-child policy. And now we're seeing their alarmist you know, predictions come to, to pass. Uh, in March of this year, China reported on its 2020 census. Uh, and uncharacteristically for them, a very professional bureaucracy they have, they, the report was two, week, two months delayed. And when it finally came out, uh, after a lot of political wrangling, it showed that China grew at the slowest rate since the early 1960s. And that is a period of time when China was facing a, uh, a horrific economic situation after a, a famine that came out of the Great Leap Forward. Uh, actual demographers, both inside in China and out, are convinced that last year China shrank. It did not grow. And what we've seen in response to that is some rather uncharacteristic kind of knee-jerk responses by the Chinese government. We saw yeah, back in 2015, maybe 2016, I can't remember the exact year, Xi Jinping announced this, this groundbreaking change to the one-child policy, and it was that you could have two children, right? So rather than tell families you can do what you want, it was you went from one to two, right? And then strangely, this March, when they announced these challenges, they announced it was three. And then last week, another announcement that tells you how serious this issue is, that the Chinese government announced that abortion could only be used in times of medical necessity. What a shocking development uh, in a country like China, right? So that just tells you they know the demographic freight train's coming down. On top of that, 
this fundamental question of, of, of if you had a Faustian bargain, bargain with your people that they can have increasing freedoms and they can grow wealthy as long as they don't touch the role of the party in politics, all of a sudden, what happens if you're no longer able to provide the same levels of economic growth? You know, what happens when you've got a lot of these fundamental challenges to society? And so the, to their credit, the government is dealing with these issues. Uh, to their discredit, they're dealing with it in a very centralized, you know, communist party way, right? And in fact, you can argue that, uh, um, again, my flippant way of saying this is that when I say I'm more worried about Chinese weakness and Chinese strength, the one person that I am confident that agrees with me is Xi Jinping, uh, because all of his actions over the last five years have not been actions of someone who is optimistic, you know, you know, it, seeing something growing and developing, but they're very much driven out of paranoia and concern about developments in Hong Kong, about democratic voices, about the role of the private sector, about individual corporate titans, you know, like Jack Ma getting too much influence. Uh, they're all reactive. Uh, and, and so in the end, it's pretty clear that the party thinks that they're synonymous with the country, so they had to strengthen the party. Uh, and, and Xi Jinping thinks that he's synonymous with the party, so he had to strengthen his own role. And what they've done now is over the course of the last five years, reversed almost every element of the Deng Xiaoping consensus. Uh, and, and so I don't know that we should rightfully expect that same level of, of growth uh, once those policies have been reversed. So again, long answer, I apologize for a bit of a drawn out response to your question. No, these are great pieces. And as we build up these different layers and, and uh, look uh, in the last set of questions at, at uh, US Australian cooperation, uh, on this particular thread, I also wanted to flip the other side. Like, what areas do you see where China overestimates or underestimates the United States? Well, um, again, I don't want to put everything on Xi Jinping. Um, the United States has had some major stumbles over the last several decades, which have in turn led to Chinese miscalculation. Um, and, and so one of the tenets of the Deng Xiaoping consensus was this notion of hide and buy, right? The China recognized that it was not yet an economically developing country. That it was, you know, again, it was likely to be the first country that grew old before it grew rich. That it had some fundamental challenges, and that it needed not just the United States, but the international system, the trading system uh, that upon which they relied. Uh, and so they were pretty careful about it. Uh, the U.S. Uh, financial crisis of 2008, um, you know, I think led a lot of Chinese to think that that perhaps prematurely that the U.S. had failed and that they were you know, on, on, on top and they began to act in that manner. Um, so if you just go back, the United States has now just finished uh, a 20 year war in Afghanistan, a 20 year war during which we invested some 14 trillion dollars, right, in a failed enterprise, which was 14 trillion dollars that did not go to building American infrastructure, to educating American you know, uh, citizens to be competitive in the global environment, to our interests elsewhere around the world. And during that same period of time, China has built up in every one of those sectors in terms of education, in terms of international aid and presence, in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but having said that, um, you know, I'm someone who believes that even having had the Afghan experience, even having had the 2008 financial crisis, even having gone through four years of Trumpism, a period of time when America's reputation in the world is cratered, uh, it's probably you know, unwise to bet against the United States. And that I think China has overestimated the decline of the United States. It's overestimated the, 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 their own um, you know, relative comparative strength to the United States at this period of time, and been a little bit premature in that match. And in the process, um, they, they've put themselves in a position where they're finding themselves increasingly isolated in, in, in great contrast to where they were a decade ago, uh, just because I think they probably overreached a little bit. So, Gordon, you mentioned this uh, incredible statistic looking at Australia, and particularly in Australia, uh, from a place like uh, Perth, its economic relations with, with China. And, and there I wanted to uh, you know, zoom in very closely, and we see this global phenomenon where 
the business sector is interacting with China simultaneously in a way that all the talk that we hear about in policy circles, about competition, rising tensions, it almost feels like parallel universes here. And so, you know, from the private sector perspective, there are some difficulties, market entry, dealing with intellectual property and so forth. But the overall idea is how they can increase market share and their stake in the Chinese marketplace, build out new supply chains. It's about business and promoting business. How do you square those two in terms of two communities simultaneously engaging China? We have the same set of facts, but two clearly different paths. What, what are some of the observations, again, coming from that, that perch that you have in Australia in specific? Well, if you'll permit me, let me look at this from with both kind of an American hat on and an Australian hat on. Yep. Um, for the bulk of the 25 years I spent in Washington, D.C., the most effective advocate for the China relationship with the U.S. business community. Uh, they, on an annual basis, lobbied for China to get most favored nation status. They were the most effective advocates for Chinese ascension into the World Trade Organization. Um, and one of the most remarkable things over the last five years has been, you know, and this is the question for China, who lost the U.S. business community? Because largely the U.S. business community is a, 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 um, um, not committed at best, if not um, slightly antagonistic towards China. And part of that is after dreams of gold, right? You know, you know 1.3 billion people, you got to be in China, invest, invest in China. They've all found extreme difficulty in actually operating within China. They've found extreme difficulty in getting money out of China. Uh, and they found themselves under increasing pressure, just like the Chinese private sector has been over the last five years in terms of the rules and regulations under which they operate. So they're, they're quite sour. And so that means probably the most significant change in the American political discourse on China is there is no longer this full-throated pro-China business voice in the United States. So that debate has shifted. Australia had a bit of a lag time. Uh, and again, Australia is much more like the other countries in the Indo-Pacific than it is the United States on its relative economic dependence on China. Um, and, and as a result, as you might imagine, the business community in Australia, similar to those in Japan or Korea or the Philippines, or again, almost every other country that tended to rely on China for its economic interactions and yet rely upon the United States uh, for security and common goods or global goods in terms of the global commons. Um, if, if you look at the case of Australia, even two years ago, there was a very serious divide between uh, the business community, which continued to see rivers of gold out of China, and the national security community or the government community, which was often derisively called uh, the, you know, the, the securitocracy. Right, who were perceived to be too focused on things like Huawei and, and the risk of Chinese investment and, and Chinese political interference and da 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 da. Um, that has, has changed dramatically over the last uh, 12 months. And it has changed dramatically because of Chinese economic coercion. You know, China has been displeased with the Australian government's decisions uh, you know, calling for a, a, a special investigation into the origin of COVID a number of other things. And there's a classic uh, phrase in China that you, 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 you kill a chicken to scare the monkeys. Uh, the view was that China wanted to make an example of Australia uh, to make sure that the other countries in the region didn't get any ideas about standing against the Chinese pressure, because China does like the idea of China big, all the other countries are small. Um, and, and, and so it, it really reached its head last year when, when the Chinese ambassador uh, in, in Canberra leaked a statement that had a 14-point demand list of things that they wanted Australia to do, all of which you know, required abandonment of, of our democracy in Australia in terms of that process, none of which were politically tenable, as they then systematically went down and began to do a variety of me measures, penalize Australian barley, Australian crayfish, Australian wines, um, and, and and as a result, Australia felt itself on the receiving end of Chinese economic coercion. And not surprisingly, public opinion has shifted dramatically. But I would, I would, one of the, the messages I say in Washington, as well as to say in Canberra, is we are not alone in this. You show me a country in the world today who doesn't have those same concerns. 
look at Canada, you know, just having barely had two of their hostages released, you know, in, in exchange for the, the heiress to, to the, the Huawei portion as well, right? You know, even countries like Laos and Cambodia that are fully bought and paid for, their governments may be, the populists are not. Look at India, their views on China have shifted dramatically, as has Japan, as has Europe, as has Germany. And again, I would say on almost every one of those cases, those are reactive. You know, every one of those countries, like Australia, like the United States, had a vested interest in the continued growth of China because of our economic ties. Uh, but decisions made in Beijing have made that relationship more sensitive. Uh, and they've caused all countries to reevaluate that relative weighting of economics and security. So on that front, uh, you know, looking very specifically at, at China's economic coercion there, I uh, wanted to uh, highlight in terms of the contrast here, uh, you know, what you've laid out in terms of China's use of economic coercion is in stark contrast uh, to U.S. Uh, use of economic statecraft, but in the form of sanctions, which is really about the rule of law, getting other countries to modify their laws in order to, you know, carry out sanctions that at the end of the day are at the U.N. Security Council resolution end of things as well. So with that, when you look at the two, uh, and we look at some of these top lessons uh, from Australia's uh, recent cases, uh, where do you see the opportunities for other countries to apply some of those lessons? as they deal with uh, rising economic coercion from Beijing themselves. Well, thank you. Um, in a nutshell, I think one of the very important lessons is that it did not work, that, that once you begin to veer into to, um, uh, areas of, of domestic political identity, you know, domestic systems, that it is very difficult to put external political pressure on a country like Australia, particularly it, a vibrant democratic society like Australia. In fact, it had the exact opposite impact. Uh, and so if the intent was to use Australia as a demonstration case, it did not work. A couple of points, though. Australia is not the only country that has been on the receiving end of Chinese economic coercion. Korea, as you know well, has suffered you know, from their decision to deploy thought creator high altitude air defense systems, bad missile batteries in Korea, uh, for which they suffered considerable economic damage as has Taiwan in recent days, you know, pineapples and a bunch of other sanctioned things, as has the Philippines, as has Vietnam. So again, this is not necessarily new to use, uh, you know, economic coercion as a tool of statecraft. But it does put into context something you mentioned, and again, for our American audience, I'll, I'll phrase it slightly different. Americans are well informed about what the U.S. calls the liberal rule, the liberal international system. That the role of, of the United States and its allies post World War II to build the system of standards, and norms, and institutions and rules, the World Bank, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the, you know, the general agreement on tariff and trade, which became the World Trade Organization, et cetera. Australians tend to phrase that slightly differently. Uh, they refer to the rules based order. That's kind of a mantra for Australian diplomats rules based order. And, and looking at it from a, an economic coercion recipient perspective, you begin to understand that. Because in the end, what is the opposite of the rules-based order? The opposite of the rules-based order is, is Thucydides, right? The strong do what they will, the weak suffer which they must, or that which they must, right? It is the might makes right. And, and if you're a country like Australia with 25 million people, it's deeply dependent on the international trading system. You don't want to live in a world where it's all about strength. You want a system of rules, standards, institutions, norms. And so this is why you see Australia working actively, even during the Trump era, where candidate the United States was not a good actor, where the United States was actively undermining the rules-based order. And, and uh, almost sector after sector after sector, institution after institution after institution. Right? Australia then, in that context, worked really closely with the Japanese and with the Indians and with ASEAN and with the Europeans to kind of hold the line on that rules-based order precisely because of the question you're answering, right? Yeah, the question you're asking, rather, because you don't want you know, China to be able to call the shots just by dint of its power. And I think you're seeing that now, not just in economics, but in security, a lot of other, other countries say, no, what we really want is we want much more of a collective response which builds up the rules-based system. 
So, you know, Gordon, at this point, as we uh, enter in kind of the last part of our conversations uh, before q and I encourage our audience members to uh, start submitting your questions. We'll, we'll turn to them uh, shortly. So on this theme, Gordon, of the rules-based order, uh, we've seen this incredible increase in activity bilaterally between the U.S. and Australia, minilaterally uh, with AUKUS, and multilaterally with, with the Quad and Quad Plus. Uh, so with this, uh, first off, for our American audience, can you tell us a little more uh, in terms of AUKUS and what brought it about? These are very recent developments. If you can put some context to that, and uh, some of the implications you see. That, that would be a great way to start off this last portion here. I, well, indeed, I, I've been very fortunate. Um, like most, uh, uh, um, uh, this is my first trip out of Australia for, for two years. Um, and and um, I couldn't have been more fortunate in the timing. And that the time that I was in New York and in Washington, D.C., directly overlapped with not just AUKUS and the announcement of that security agreement, but the Quad. Uh, leaders meeting the first time ever in person and then prior to that the Osmond Ministry of all things that Ambassador Jane Duke mentioned. Um, look, in the 25 years I have spent in Washington DC, I woke up every morning knowing that I was going to have to make the case that Asia is important, pay attention to Asia. Sitting as I do now in Perth, I never have to make that case. Everybody understands that intuitively. But having said that, uh, Washington DC and Canada, the Canberra, and our press corps, we still have a little bit of a European tilt, right? So I was a little bit dismayed this past week where you know, if for people who are viewing this today, even out here in LA, although LA is similar to Perth, I think LA tends to have a bit more of a, of, of a, a, a westward focus than you might get in, in Washington, D.C. So much of the reporting around AUKUS was centered on two things. Number one, the subs, uh, which is important, and number two, the French and the French reaction. Uh, and, and they missed what it was all about. So let me just give you a little context. Um, the lead up to these meetings was a remarkably successful series of, of bilateral two plus two meetings. So ministers of foreign affairs and ministers of defense together. So our minister of foreign affairs, Maurice Payne, our minister of defense, uh, Peter Dutton, together traveled to Indonesia, a landmark agreement, you know, first visit post COVID. Together, they traveled to India. Again, restarted the Australia-India free trade agreement talks, right? They traveled to Korea, uh, where they deepened that strategic relationship. Then they traveled to Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, again, the coverage, casual viewer will not understand how important these Osman ministerial meetings. So Osman is the name given to the U.S.-Australia 2 plus 2 meeting. So Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense meeting with their counterparts from Australia. And that that agreement this year, and I've read the last 20 of them, uh, this year's Osman Joint Communique outlines in so many areas of deeper integration, closer cooperation between Australia and the United States that have real ramifications for Australia and for the U.S. Uh, and for the Indo-Pacific region. And yet that all kind of got swept away by all the excitement and focus on AUKUS and, and the French response. Uh, similarly, the Friday meeting, the first ever in-person meeting between the leaders of India, Japan, uh, the United States, uh, and, and, uh, and Australia, you know, built on that virtual quad meeting from March 13th of this year, you know, focused on, on, on actually moving forward on the focus on vaccines, on, on technology, on supply chain, on climate change, really quite a substantive agreement. And then you overlay that with the surprise. Uh, and this is a surprise that nobody outside of the closest circles of government knew about, which was the decision of the United States to work together with treaty allies, the United Kingdom and Australia, to build a new security agreement. And everybody's focused on the submarines, but it's actually much broader, much deeper than that. Essentially, it is a level of intimacy, a level of trust, a level of technology and information sharing that functionally it becomes more of the multilateralization of our security agreements. The United States historically has been hub and spokes. The U.S. Yeah. is the ally, and it has lots of different individual treaty allies. And of course, we'd rather have people cooperate together, but it really hasn't been a collective in any way, shape, or form. Uh, this is nascent. It's just started, but it is really significant. And again, I don't want to downplay the subs. The subs are extremely important. Um, you know, Australia... Uh, I don't think ever considered the prospect that it would be able to get 
what is effectively the crown jewel of American defense technology, which is the nuclear propulsion systems in the submarine program, right? And so the fact that the U.S. agreed to work together with Great Britain to get those for Australia speaks of trust, it speaks of, of cooperation, it speaks of a shared interest on what I was saying earlier, the, the stability of the rules-based order. But let me add one thing onto this, because I think this is really, really important. Having said all of that, uh, looking at this from an Australian perspective, particularly looking at it from Perth, where today the Germans, for the first time ever, have a naval frigate uh, you know, docking at Fremantle, the, Perth, the, 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 the port there in Perth, uh, called the Bayern. Uh, just last month, the Brits had a, an aircraft carrier battle group all throughout the region. Uh, we want the French to be active in the Indo Pacific. We welcome the ASEAN Indo Pacific outlook. We want the Europeans as a whole, and the European Union has its own Indo-Pacific strategy. We want France and Great Britain active, because in the end, there are some in Washington, there are certainly some in Beijing, uh, and there are some in Europe that have the view that basically Europeans should take care of Europe. Uh, that will free up American resources to, to do mano a mano conflict with China, and I don't think that's the way the U.S. does or should look at it, and it's certainly not the way Australia does or should look at it, really. This is about our values and our system. And the system requires that we have a rules-based order. So the more countries that are involved, the more that complicates Chinese decision-making. The more that means it's not a mano a mano G2 complication. It's really about what the system is. It is about the rules-based order. So from an Australian perspective, it's been a really good last 10 days. A lot going on that front. I think on that note, uh, we'll, we'll uh, transition now to questions. Uh, thank you for laying that all out. We went through many different layers, and you know, Gordon, the way you you kind of wove that all together, uh, perfect transition now to audience Q and A. Uh, I'll turn over now to Jessica, Vice President of Events, on the uh, Q and A portion. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, John and uh, Professor Flake. Uh, before we get started on the Q&A, I just want to again thank our members and audience for their support. Um, it's because of donations and your membership that we are able to continue to host programs like these. So if you are able to, please go to our website at lawacth.org and join to become a member or make a donation. We greatly appreciate it. All right, Professor Flake, uh, the first question. Um, this Audience member notes that you are the co-chair of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Has there been any movement in restoring human rights under Kim Jong-un? Well, thank you for that question. Thank you, Jessica, for moderating. I, I, I will note that uh, I, I, I have a bias towards West Coast-based foreign policy organizations. So I, I, I applaud the great work that you're doing at the World Affairs Council here in, in LA. Um, I have... Uh, as most of the viewers will know, I've spent the better part of the last 35 years working on Korea, uh, and, you, and a good chunk of that with a particular focus on North Korea. In addition to the issues like nuclear weapons and, and missiles, uh, and just this week, a number of missile tests try, that tend to draw uh, people's attention, it's essential for us to remember that there is this ongoing humanitarian catastrophe taking place inside North Korea in terms of the treatment of their people. Uh, and the short answer, uh, Jessica, is, is no. Uh, things have not gotten better. By all accounts, they've gotten worse. Uh, during a period of time during the, the rule of Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-il was, again, I never thought in a million years I would look back on that era as a relatively stable, predictable period of time. Uh, but he, he was um, dealt with a lot of difficulties in terms of famine, uh, the cessation of, of support from the Soviet Union and then from, from, from China in a significant way, real economic privation, but he was quite realistic. Uh, and during that period of time, there was an expansion of people's ability to move around the country and to leave the country. So there was a steady flow of North Korean defectors out into, into South Korea, into China, throughout Southeast Asia and the world beyond. Um, Kim Jong-un has strengthened the North Korean state. Uh, and in so doing, crack down on the abilities of the, the North Korean people to move, to communicate, and very importantly, to leave. Uh, and in, by all accounts, uh, has continued to be a pretty brutal dictator in terms of human rights. Uh, you mentioned that I, I've served now for a number of years as co-chairman uh, 
after serving for years before that on the board of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. So if anybody's interested in these issues in particular, just go to hrnk.org. They have done you know, two decades now of, of very detailed behind the scenes studies of North Korean's prisoners camps, uh, of the legal infrastructure, almost every possible element of human rights that you can imagine uh, with the intent of, of raising the profile of these issues. And of course, obviously hoping to solve them. Um, there is, it's difficult to make the case that the, 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 the situation has improved uh, because it is so closely tied to the nature of the regime itself uh, and that it's a strength in the regime. But by all accounts, the regime right now is stronger today than it was five years ago. And then as a result, the human rights situation is worse. Just as a side note on that, because I, I did get to go to North Korea a few years ago. And one of the things that we learned about was um, that there is very little organic material in the soil. So the ability to grow their own food and to be able to do things like that is, is very, very difficult for North Koreans. Is it because of the embargoes and things like that, that they can't get fertilizer and seeds? And we just drove past empty fields for hours and, and they were having a very difficult time growing anything. No, so I, uh, I actually wrote a book back in 19, 1993, I think it was, called Paved with Good Intentions, the NGO Experience uh, in North Korea. It was a co-edited volume that I edited together with uh, Scott Snyder probably the best Korea specialist we've got in DC uh, today. He works at the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, and we did this project because um, it was, uh, oh, it was in the late 90s, I'm sorry. It, it, uh, the presumption was that with this unprecedented number of international NGOs engaged in North Korea, that we would gain this window inside North Korea. So we did this whole project. Uh, and it, the project was a failure. It still produced an interesting book. The project was a failure because we, number one, learned how good North Korea was at controlling access from international parties. And number two, we learned how dysfunctional the international NGO community was, right? So, you know, we still had a conclusion, you still wrote a book. Uh, but in the end, uh, North Korea is a country that should not necessarily be food self-sufficient. It's got 20 plus million people uh, in, in, a, in a northerly climb with very little arable land. Uh, and yet the, the activities of the regime have made that situation far worse and their priorities have made that situation far worse, right? So they could, with just a fraction of their military budget, feed the entire population. That's never been the case. Uh, they've largely held their own population hostage in efforts to get international aid. By all accounts, you know, you know, the COVID era has been difficult for North Korea. There are among the international humanitarian aid community growing concern about what the situation is like there in North Korea. And again, I would just remind your viewers uh, that by most accounts in the late 1990s, 97, 98, there was a, a horrible famine in North Korea that largely has to be considered a man-made famine. It wasn't a drought. It wasn't like something in, that you see periodically in sub-Saharan Africa, because during that same period of time, no one died in neighboring South Korea or Japan or even poor countries like Mongolia because of the economic conditions. It was really caused by the system. And again, by most accounts, a million to two million North Koreans died during that period of time, right? Horrific, horrific experiences. And so people who watch that, whether they're concerned about the regime, whether about political stability or human rights, continue to watch North Korea because of its closed nature, because it's not integrated in the national trading system. Uh, and are deeply concerned about basics, like feeding the population. Yeah. The one thing I found weird when I was there was how few bugs there were. I don't know if that's from pollution from China or what, but I grew up in Idaho where we had a lot of bugs and I know Australia has lots of fun creatures and Australia, uh, North Korea had, had no bugs. So anyway, just kind of a tangent. Well, I've, been in North um, Korea for 30 I've never once thought about North Korean bugs, but now I'm going to, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> just notice, even in like the little ponds in the in the mountains, there were like no little water skippers or anything, and I just I found that strange. Um, Scott Morrison took office as prime minister in August of 2018 as leader of the Liberal Party. Has he been an effective leader? Um, obviously, like all democracies, uh, Australia has vibrantly different opinions uh, on this issue. And so if you're looking at this from a Labour Party perspective in Australia, there are actions he has taken that our people are concerned about, right? He has been pilloried internally as somebody who is all kind of all show but no substance. Uh, 
uh, and he's had a number of, of big challenges, uh, foremost of which is, is, is COVID, uh, the international response to COVID. He has been roundly criticized by the relative slow uh, federal government response to COVID, and in particular to securing international vaccines. Uh, but in so many areas, Australia is, is kind of the lucky country. Um, because of its early success at lockdowns, uh, because of its early success at, at relative isolation, keeping the virus out, um, yeah, I think to date, Australia has had about 13,000 fatalities due to COVID, uh, and maybe maybe it's 12, I think it's not even, not even, not even 13 yet. Uh, and if you, you get that number and you extrapolate it up to the size of the United States by population, which is 13 times larger than, than Australia, you still come come up with with uh, I'm sorry I, I, my numbers were wrong about 1,200 fatalities which if you extrapolate it up to the size of the United States is probably about 14,000 deaths is the number that's coming with whereas the United States is just approach, approaching 700,000 so in general uh, the populace tends to be supportive of him he still remains generally popular popular uh, there are some challenges he's facing in terms of this period of time in foreign policy. Um, you know, there's going to be um, some, some, some kind of career-defining decisions just in this last month. I mean, obviously, AUKUS, AUKUS is a big deal. The events of the last couple of weeks are a really big deal. We at the Perth U.S. Asia Center were, were fortunate to host him in Western Australia on his way to the G7. Australia is not a member of the G7, but the fact that he was invited, uh, now we actually now have a better understanding of that meeting that took place at the G7 between Boris Johnson, uh, U.S. President Joe Biden, and our Prime Minister Scott Morrison. At the time, everybody in Australia thought it was really weird. They kind of thought, why did Boris Johnson crash uh, the meeting with, with, uh, with Scott Morrison and Joe Biden? And, and, now, and now we look back in hindsight and it was good. So he's done a pretty good job of, of, of laying out, and I think that speech, uh, I commend that speech. Just Google Scott Morrison foreign policy speech or Perth U.S. Asia Scott Morrison. I commend that speech to all of you. It was probably one of the most full-throated defenses of Australian values in foreign policy that, I, that I've seen. It's a really, really good speech. Um, but he's got challenges coming up as well. He's got uh, climate change. His own party is tied knots over the issue of climate change. Uh, and so whether or not he decides to go to Scotland this, this next week is it, going to be something that kind of defines his legacy. He's facing an election uh, that has to be called by March of next year. Um, and, and so history will ultimately judge uh, as well the Australian populace, how well he has done. Uh, but I don't think there's any leaders around the world that have escaped the last uh, two years unscathed. Thank you. What type of pact is AUKUS? What is the chance of success? Um, it, it is still ill-defined, right? It is, it is not a formal alliance, although all parties are already allies. You know, if not necessarily in a triangular shape, it's a security agreement. And again, the focus is on submarines because submarines are really, really important. Uh, and and for a country like Australia to get uh, uh, nuclear propulsion capabilities is a really big deal, right? In terms of capability and reach. Uh, and then when you put together American capabilities with Australian capabilities with UK capabilities, then it also has implications for you know, the, the system writ large in terms of the world. Um, that's going to take a long time to work out. In the meantime, there's an awful lot of things that take place, uh, you know, under, underneath that. And that's why I said probably in the short term, the more significant elements of it are the technology sharing, the intelligence sharing. And I think that will continue to develop. But it's not yet fully defined what it is. You wouldn't call it an alliance. It's not a NATO kind of thing yet. Uh, uh, and again, these are these are parties that were already closely coordinating in almost every element. Uh, but so far, the reaction from the region has been quite remarkable. Japan, uh, we at the Perth U.S. Asia Center just the uh, day before yesterday hosted uh, the Japanese Parliamentary Vice Minister to, for Defense, uh, Matsukawa uh, Ryo, uh, Ryu rather, and uh, it came out vocally supportive of office. The Indians have been very vocal. There has been some concern both voice internally in Australia, as well as in, in, uh, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. But in general, as I was ta talking about earlier in my conversation with John, it's a reaction to the changing dynamics in the Indo-Pacific. This is really not about the French. 
You know, this is really about, you know, how do we best prepare ourselves to deal with the challenges that are currently emerging in the Indo-Pacific? Where is New Zealand in the packs in the Pacific, like Australia? Yeah, so New Zealand is a little bit interesting. Um, um, with my apologies to, to my uh, uh, Australian countrymen, Australia has had a long history of Oceania. Okay? Um, you know, a, a relatively small initial British colony, a long ways away from Britain, in what was perceived to be a kind of a hostile region. Traditionally, uh, Australia thought of itself as a Pacific power. And that was largely true in World War II as well. Its real strength and its expertise, and, and it has been really up until recent days, was in the South Pacific. Uh, and if you go to Canberra today, among military officials and diplomats and government officials, there's a tremendous depth of expertise in and affinity for Oceania, for East Timor, for Papua New Guinea, for the, for the, the South Pacific in general. Um, and um, it is only in recent years that Australia has thought more broadly. So in the late 1980s, early 1990s, under the Keating government and before, Australia's desire, along with New Zealand, to integrate north is really what led to the term Asia Pacific. Many of your viewers won't remember this, but when I began my, my professional career, nobody used the term Asia Pacific. We all talked about East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Oceania, this mystical place by, Oce by Antarct um, no, Atlantis somewhere floating out there, right? Uh, and, and as Korea and Japan decided they wanted to integrate South, and Australia and, 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 uh, and New Zealand decided they wanted to integrate North, you had the creation of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Initiative. You know, and so ultimately, Asia Pacific is how do you incorporate Australia and New Zealand into Asia? That's it. That's Asia Pacific whether it's Pacific Basin Economic Cooperation Council, whatever it is, right? Indo-Pacific, on the other hand, is fundamentally about our, our next point of view, right? From Perth, how do you integrate the Indian Ocean and India into the Asia Pacific? Without India, there is no Indo-Pacific, right? That's what it really is about. It's about that diagonal through the process. The reason I go into that length in explaining that is New Zealand remains very much a Pacific-focused country. It is in an island in itself. It is firmly situated in the South Pacific. It is much further away from the fulcrum point of the Indo-Pacific. And so, not surprisingly, it has been more skeptical about the framing of the Indo-Pacific that they say that Australia has, largely driven out of, 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 of political leaders coming out of Western Australia. You can see it differently in that front. Uh, and then similarly, uh, New Zealand has also had a, a bit of an independent streak when it comes to alliances, right? Uh, they're still technically a member of ANZUS, but the ANZUS, Australia, New Zealand, U.S. alliance, uh, which just celebrated its 70th anniversary, the New Zealand part of it has a big asterisk by it, right? Because of uh, the decisions in the 1980s for New Zealand to kind of basically to put on pause major elements of that alliance treaty. And so New Zealand's there. They're one of Australia's closest partners. They're likely to work on everything, but they're likely to always have a slightly different perspective. But again, from Perth, and most of my American friends said, ah, oh, you must go to New Zealand all the time. I'm closer to Hong Kong than I'm to Auckland in Perth, right? Auckland's a long ways away. Uh, and, and as a result, their, their, their views and their role, both in terms of size and perspective, are going to be slightly different. Hope I didn't offend, offend too many TVs out there today. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get some emails. How big a deal will it be for Australia to adopt nuclear submarines? Oh, again, I would emphasize this is a ways off. It is a difficult process, but it really just comes about what you can do with them, right? Um, uh, we are fortunate. Uh, HMAS Sterling, Australia's largest naval base, which is called Fleet Base West, is located just south of Perth uh, in Garden Island, uh, like near Fremantle. Uh, and, and there is a regular visits of U.S. ships, including U.S. submarines. Um, and I remember a recent uh, visit on the Los Angeles class submarine, I think it's Los Angeles class, across the USS Oklahoma. And one of the striking things about a nuclear submarine is um, that they can stay underwater for 30 years. You know, the only thing they lack is food. Food alone and sanity uh, is the requirement. They make their own water, they make their own air, they can go anywhere without surfacing for fuel. Whereas the, the current, you know, uh, the submarines that, that, that that 
that Australia had, the diesel-based submarine, has to surface regularly for fuel, can go as far, can go as long. It just is it's it's not definitely a blue water capable uh, force. And so nuclear submarines, if you're Australia and you really have a broader Indo-Pacific interest, whether it's Indian Ocean, and again, Australia, just if the viewers will think back to uh, the search to MH370. Australia is really, even today, the only country that had the capability and the political will to project seriously out into the Indian Ocean, a big, big you know, area of ocean, and that search for MH370, that's a lot of area where you need capability to reach that far. Then you start thinking about that broader sweep of the, of, of the Indian Pacific and, and challenges to our trade routes and everybody's trade routes in, in, in the Indian Pacific, you know, greater range, greater capability, greater interoperability, all just means, uh, you know, a stronger overall system. But again, I'd emphasize it's a long period of time. I'm not a sub guy. I'm not a things painted gray military expert, but, but everyone that I talk to says it's just a, a quantum leap in terms of capabilities. Thank you. Can you speak a bit more about foreign influence in Australia's elections and how the government there is responding to it? Um, obviously, American viewers will not be um, um, unaware of these issues here in the U.S., uh, although they're much more politically debated here in the U.S. In Australia, they're less politically debated. Uh, um, there are also some strange things in Australia that, that um, are not yet kind of outlawed the way they are in the United States. So still not illegal for Australian political parties or politicians to receive donations from from foreign source, sources, although there are individual party laws that are being changed and that process is shifting. Um, in general, um, Australia is the, the canary in the coal mine. Um, it, because the United States is so large, because the United States economy is so large and so powerful, the level of attention paid to cyber issues in the United States, the, the level of attention paid to uh, you know, levels of interference in academia, the role of the Confucius Institute, the level of attention paid to, to uh, you know, technical, technological risks, uh, such as the role of corporations like Huawei, which ultimately, as proven again last week, you know, respond to and are a client essentially of the central government in China, um, have, have been more apparent earlier in Australia. Um, and so the interesting thing is the Australian university system it has been more aware of and, and more proactive on concerns about Chinese political interference in education, you know, uh, than, than their American counterparts are. So I've had a great privilege of several delegations to, to visit the United States led by the Group of Eight, the, the elite universities in Australia, uh, where they put together a UFIT, a, you know, University Foreign Interference Transparency Scheme, where they want to be transparent. And those, when we visited the White House and and American counterparts, Americans were saying, we just have not thought about this yet because you know, we're bigger, right? Whereas in Australia, you couldn't, order, you couldn't ignore it. The same thing has been true in just in terms of money, in terms of politics, uh, in, in terms of the um, utilization of local ethnic communities in terms of that. But the area I think has probably been most visible in Australia has been on, on basic uh, national security investment communications technologies. And so while not, Australia remains a very open economy, even much more open than the United States in terms of the openness to investment and, and trade, um, uh, and probably 98% of all investments from overseas into Australia improve, there have been a number of very high profile ones that have caught attention just because of concerns. Uh, and so there was one over an electricity grid, which then also had telecommunications infrastructure called Ausgrid, where the Chinese investment was not back. And the most high, high profile of them were a decision now close to 10 years ago, eight, eight, nine years ago, to exclude Chinese companies, and in particular Huawei, from the national broadband network, the NBN, uh, and then more recently to exclude Huawei from Australia's 5G rollout. And that just, again, just came down to, part of it was economic, right? You could do it. But then the effort to go back and close all the back doors and deal with all the cyber vulnerabilities in there would be more expensive than going with the more expensive offer in the first place. But a big chunk of it was just matters of trust in terms of that process. 
uh, but it's hotly debated in Australia. Uh, and in, in, in many things, people assume, uh, and many people even in the Australian discourse assume that Aussies are, are anti-China, which they're not at all, right? Uh, or that they're doing so just because they're bidden to do so by the Americans, right? That, that tends to be the, the narrative that comes out of Beijing. But I would say on almost every one of these cases, again, Australia was at the coalface. They experienced it first, and they in turn then helped shape American views on this issue, not the other way around. Great. Well, we are at the end of the hour. So, uh, Professor Flake, thank you so much. And to our audience for all of your great questions. Um, Dr. Park, I want to turn this back over to you. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Jessica. A fantastic Q&A session there. I, Gordon, I wanted to give you a chance to last word before I wrap up for uh, my part here. Oh, look, um, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm strongly supportive of, of making sure that West Coast perspectives, which are slightly different, uh, you know, are filtered into the foreign policy uh, arena. So I applaud the efforts of the World Affairs Council of, of, uh, of, of Los Angeles. Uh, and um, and uh, we're very fortunate to have such a strong Australian consulate here in, in, in Los Angeles. I look forward to future collaboration to make sure that we better understand the Pacific together. Excellent. And uh, on behalf of the uh, organizers, Gordon, thank you so much for the clarity and the insight that you brought to the discussion today. And uh, a warm thank you to the audience for joining as well. Over to you, Kim. Thank you. Professor Flake and Dr. Park, this was superb. We learned so much. This was so informative. We so appreciate your time and your expertise today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Safe travels, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you. For our viewers, we have a terrific lineup of programs coming next week on Monday on Tyranny. Is our democratic republic on the brink of authoritarianism? Tuesday, of course, politics in the time of coronavirus with Dan Schnur every Tuesday at 5 p.m. On October 7th, a conversation with Edison International President and CEO Pedro Pizarro on California's pivotal climate change moment. October 13th, Risk, a user's guide with General Stanley McChrystal. October 15th, a conversation with Dr. Fiona Hill. She is the Senior Director of European Russian Affairs at the UN National Security Council. And on the 21st, Social Media's Dark Side, a conversation with Roger McNamee. Please go to our website at lawacth.org, register today, become a member, make a donation, Stay safe and we'll see you next week. Thanks everyone.